Welcome to the presentation of a lecture from Gnostic Radio, a free public service from Telema Press. Gnostic Radio broadcasts free lectures from the Gnostic tradition of Samael on Vior. Gnosis is the root wisdom of all the world's great religions. Gnosis is a universal doctrine containing the precise science to free the soul from suffering. Each lecture explores another aspect of this timeless and sacred knowledge. Many of these lectures are supported by additional information on our website. Each Saturday, Gnostic Radio broadcasts live. The live lecture is accompanied by an anonymous chat session, allowing listeners to read additional explanations related to the lecture and providing an opportunity to ask questions of the speaker. All of the efforts of Telema Press are supported by listeners like you. For more information or to make a donation, visit our website at GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we will begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. of this lecture was made possible by donations from listeners like you. Welcome to our continuing series on the book of Revelation. We've arrived at chapter 4 of the famous Kabbalistic and alchemical book of the Revelation of St. John. There are some images related to this lecture for those who are listening to the lecture uh, over the radio, you can visit the website of GnosticTeachings.org, go to the course on the book of Revelation, and you'll find some images related to this topic. In previous lectures, we've been discussing the nature of this book, the book of Revelation. And the fact that in order to understand it, we have to have some grasp or comprehension of the two trees of the Garden of Eden. And these two trees <clears throat> symbolize alchemy and Kabbalah. So these two sciences are the wisdom which illuminate the true meaning behind this book of Revelation. Today's lecture is on the fourth chapter which is the chapter about the throne set in heaven. This chapter, being the fourth, of course is building upon the themes set forward in the first three chapters. And that's what we've been talking about so far. In the first, we were introduced to a, a certain level of symbols. John as the writer of this book, symbolizing the initiate, or the person who's working to advance in the path of the self-realization of the being. We're also introduced to the character of the Son of Man, who is, of course, the intimate Christ. This fundamental relationship provides the basis upon which the entire book must be understood. John, as the initiate, represents what in Gnosis is called the human soul. And the human soul is our essential human consciousness, which in us, in our current state, is underdeveloped. But by applying the science of Kabbalah and alchemy, the essence of that human soul can be developed towards its full potential. And John is a symbol of that. That development is made possible by the intervention of the Son of Man, or in other words, the Christ. That development is what we call the path of initiation. And the process of that path, the details of that path, 
the precise science required in order to walk that path has always been hidden. Symbolized in many books, in many teachings, in many traditions. But the actual, literal, explicit instructions have been hidden. Of course, we know that in the last century, a lot of information about this path has become available. The most direct, most potent, most explicit, most revealing information, of course, is found in the teachings of Samael on Vior. To understand the nature of that science and the nature of the path requires more than just the intellectual study of those books. It requires action. The process of initiation is a process of activating the consciousness itself. It's easy to read a book, and it's easy to theorize. It's very difficult to have direct experience. It's very difficult to have practical, personal knowledge of real occultism. I mention that because the book of Revelation is a book of real occultism. And to comprehend that book requires that we are entering into the direct experience of real occultism. Without that, this book remains as a set of symbols that we will never penetrate. This fourth chapter is much more complex than the first three. It contains a very dense set of symbols whose real comprehension, real understanding, cannot be accessed by the intellect. You'll probably see that as soon as you try to read it. It's complex, it's dense, difficult for the mind to comprehend. The consciousness, however, can understand it if the consciousness is applied. To develop that form of understanding, to have the capacity to comprehend a work such as the book of Revelation, requires that one is taking practical steps. One is living in accordance with the teachings, and accessing direct experience for oneself. This, of course, is a daily effort. This is not something that can be accomplished in the future or when circumstances are somehow easier. Life exists in the instant in which we are. There is no past. There is no future. To think about, to imagine to dream about one day I will have these experiences or one day maybe I will create my solar astral body. This is a form of fantasy, which is a distraction. It's necessary for all students to be present, to be in the moment, to study oneself as one is now. And from that basis, real experience can be acquired. This fundamental science, the science that entwines the two trees of Kabbalah and alchemy, is very exact. It requires a kind of comprehension that has no illusion and no uncertainty. Things that are left vague and insubstantial, that are left merely as theories, can become stumbling blocks for us. In order to penetrate the veil of mystery, we have to have the capacity to activate the consciousness free of the ego. This capacity is developed through the rigorous application of discipline from moment to moment. Disciplining the consciousness to pay attention. In the process of paying attention, learning how to direct attention, how to manage how we pay attention from moment to moment, We establish a bridge. We build a connection between ourselves as a potential initiate and our being, our spirit, that divine intelligence inside of us that can illuminate our understanding. It is only through the rigorous and persistent 
work to activate the consciousness that the being, our own inner spirit, can give us guidance. In the beginning, for the initiate, for the practitioner, this is extremely difficult because the mind is very active, caught in conflicts, caught in duality, battling between yes and no, right and wrong, good and bad. This fundamental battle of opposing theories, of opposing ideas, and opposing concepts keeps the mind in a state of agitation and chaos. And in the midst of that raging sea, the essence finds it difficult to stand still and observe. With persistence and with transmutation, little by little, the essence grows, develops strength. The initiate who knocks on the door, rather the student, the aspirant, who knocks on the door of initiation, is the one who transmutes the sexual forces, who does not waste them. This begins, of course, with saving that energy physically. But that energy must be saved in all the levels of the mind. It must be saved emotionally. It must be saved intellectually. That is, we must not fantasize. We must not dream. The mind in the three brains has to be managed with conscious attention. So with transmutation, psychological work through self-observation and self-remembering, and through performance of good deeds, we're knocking on the door. In that instant, we receive help. But the help doesn't come necessarily in ways that we expect. The help that we receive is help to see ourselves. We receive challenges. We receive difficulties. We receive opportunities in order to learn about what we need to change. To knock on the door at the entrance of the path towards the self-realization of the being is not a door of entry into bliss, into heavenly states. It is a door of entry into difficulty, self-reflection, and pain. But it is a kind of pain that is necessary in order for us to grow. It is the pain of the consciousness recognizing its mistakes. This is a necessity It is not something to be avoided. To comprehend our own mistakes is a requirement in order for us to reach purity and perfection. If we don't understand why something is wrong, then we are likely to repeat it. Comprehension implies complete understanding, and comprehension is the basis upon which we walk. Knocking upon that door we begin to receive tests. And in the first portion of this work, we begin to pass through nine specific ordeals. And these are called the initiations of minor mysteries or lesser mysteries. These initiations are a probationary path. They are a set of ordeals and tests within which we have to prove our patience, our sincerity, our temperance, our willingness to withstand difficulty, our willingness to overcome our own desires, and our fidelity towards our own being. These tests come in many forms, and they come in many ways. Many students pass through these types of tests, and don't realize it. In order to have comprehension and understanding about the nature of these tests, we have to be developing the capacity to remember our internal experiences and to remember our dreams. Of course, in the beginning of the work, this is difficult because the mind is so agitated. The best remedy in this case is meditation. 
by persistent, regular, disciplined practice, quieting the mind. We improve our memory. We settle the ethers of the vital body, which make it easier for the memories to be transmitted into our brain. With transmutation, we also ease the process and assist the process of retrieving memories. So then it becomes possible for us to recall the tests and ordeals we're passing through internally. This stage of development is a process within which the initiate is being shown a probationary or sort of test aspect, a sort of uh, preparatory aspect of what's to come. The student is faced with difficulties, which may seem insurmountable. The student is faced with tests of their own psychology to see how they react, to see how they behave. Many fail and try again and try again. That's the basis of the work. But some, perhaps many, fail and walk away. And this is unfortunate. The ones who persist manage to equilibrate the energies in their three brains, to, to reach a stage, a certain degree of psychological equilibrium. They also reach a stage of a certain level of energetic equilibrium because the serpent of Eve, the serpent of Ida, related to the caduceus that entwines around our spinal column, is restored to its proper functioning. When that occurs, the two serpents, Ida and Pingala, make a connection. There's a kind of psychological benefit that occurs with this process. If that student, if that practitioner is working with a spouse, and only if they're working with a spouse, there's the possibility to awaken the Kundalini to awaken that fire of the Holy Spirit, that intelligence, which resides in the base of the spinal column. The advent of the fire, which is the process of awakening that kundalini, has moral requirements. Firstly, it can only occur between the combination of male and female, man and wife, in alchemy, in chastity, a single person cannot awaken the kundalini. They can experience sparks related to the two serpents of Ida and Pingala. They can awaken consciousness. They can eliminate ego. They can make a certain progress in their own internal development, understanding themselves. But they cannot enter into the initiations of greater mysteries. They cannot awaken the kundalini until they work with a spouse. The couple who passes the moral requirements, the ordeals, related to the advent of the fire, then begin the process of raising that fire up the spinal column. The spinal column, of course, is the central structure of our physical body, upon which the whole body depends. And that spinal column actually has seven aspects. It has a physical aspect. It also has a vital or etheric aspect, which is more subtle. And beyond that, the astral, the mental, causal, buddhic, and atmic aspects. Seven bodies with seven spinal columns. When the advent of the fire occurs, when the kundalini first awakens, the fire begins to raise up the spinal column of the physical body. The first thing that must happen is that the chakra muladhara, this first church of Ephesus, must become active and awaken. And of course this has requirements and ordeals and tests, and it's difficult. The, some of the moral requirements to, related to awakening this church include one must be practicing sexual magic. 
There's no other way to awaken a church to activate a chakra completely. We have to have patience. We must endure suffering. And we must perform good work on ourselves. Those who fulfill these requirements and pass these required ordeals receive certain benefits. That chakra confers certain gifts to the consciousness, to the being. Little by little, the initiate continues. Each vertebra of the spinal column has corresponding tests. 33 vertebra make up our spinal column. And of course, the 33 vertebra are symbolized in the story of Jesus by the 33 years he's purported to have been alive. Also symbolized in the, Mason, uh, the Freemasonry tradition by the 33 degrees. These 33 degrees symbolize the 33 vertebra of the spinal column. And the many tests and ordeals an initiate has to face in order to raise that fire. This is a long difficult, painful process. It's painful because each step requires progress in moral purity, sanctity, requires progress in chastity, and requires sacrifice. These three, charity, sanctity, and sacrifice, are required. Charity, sanctity, and chastity, rather are required for every step. Those who fail to perform good deeds, to serve their fellow men, to sacrifice on behalf of others, fail to make progress in the evolution and development of the Kundalini. Those who fail to discover themselves, to conquer their own moral ineptitudes, their own moral failings, will fail in the progress and development of the Kundalini and those who fail to acquire chastity cannot make progress. So those three aspects are the key. Little by little, by facing ordeals, comprehending oneself, the initiate, the student, raises the kundalini degree by degree, slowly. This entire process implies, really, the development of the heart. Chastity, charity, and sacrifice are all really, in their essence, conscious emotion. To have conscious remorse. To have conscious comprehension in the heart of what's right and what's wrong. So we say, in essence, the rising of the Kundalini is based in the merits of the heart. In the development of the heart. Not the mind, not the intellect. The development of the Kundalini has nothing to do with studying books. It has nothing to do with studying theories. You can be completely illiterate, unable to read and write, and awaken your Kundalini and raise the fire up the spinal column. It does not require books. It requires moral purity, chastity, sacrifice. Little by little, as the fire raises up the spinal column, it illuminates the seven churches, which we've been discussing in the previous lectures. Each church has moral requirements, certain conditions that have to be met in order for the intelligence that manages the powers of that church to open that church to us and confer those powers upon us. Such powers are not given easily or lightly or without responsibility. They are not given just because. They are not given in one day. Everything has its price. To receive divine gifts costs one's own life. It costs everything that one has. But the return, the benefit, is immeasurable. Yeah, there's pain. The path is painful. 
comprehension of one's defects is painful. But the awakening of the consciousness is ecstatic, contains great beauty, great joy, great happiness. The heart becomes awakened, subtle, sensitive, filled with delicate feelings and very strong ones. This is something that the common person cannot comprehend because the heart is so dead in humanity. But the process of the fire, awakening the churches, awakening the chakras, activates capacities of the consciousness to perceive, to feel, to understand. With the second church, we have to develop filial love for the being. We have to develop the capacity to bear tribulations, to bear difficulties, with patience and humility. With the third church, we have to be improving our chastity. And we cannot eat food that was offered to idols. That is, we have to reject intellectualism. We cannot be intellectualizing. We cannot be theorizing. We have to become simple. We have to open the heart. In the fourth, more development of chastity, charity, service, faith, patience, and love. These are not ideas. These are states of being. In each of these requirements, we face ordeals and tests in life. We're presented with situations within which our reactions and our responses are measured. We receive criticism, and we are observed. Do we respond with anger, with resentment, with pride? We may feel those things, but do we act on them? Or do we instead control it, meditate, and return the injustices offered to us with love? To respond with love. This is what's required. And this is difficult. But this is every step of the progress of the Kundalini is measured in this manner. With the next church, vigilance of the consciousness, good deeds, and repentance. Repentance, not of material things, Repentance of our own desires. It's not a question of having wealth or not having wealth. It is a question of being attached, of having dependency. To really establish a permanent center of gravity in the consciousness requires that we extract the consciousness from our dependence on other things. As we are, we're dependent on the attention we get from others. We're dependent on the feelings we have by the possessions that we hoard. We're dependent on our status, on our education, on a job, on the opinion of another person. These kind of dependencies make us weak and make us vulnerable. To really develop the consciousness, to make it strong, it has to be collected and made dependent only on the being. To have its entire center of gravity rooted in the inner self, the true self, the Buddha who lies within. So long as our consciousness is trapped in the dependence on money, the dependence on comfort, the dependence on particular physical or emotional or mental structures in our lives. We remain weak and vulnerable. The repentance is the repentance of attachment, the repentance of our own desires. The sixth church is developed based upon sexual potency, veracity, and fidelity. And this is fidelity to the being, fidelity to our own inner God. 
So you can see that each step is very difficult, very demanding. The couple working in transmutation in white tantrism who persists, who manages to face each problem, each difficulty, but respond with love for one another, for other people, and for the being. This couple receives the benefits of passing the ordeals, raising the kundalini, and experiencing all the joys and wonders that are then active in the consciousness. This process takes time. It takes persistence and discipline. But it has to be performed over and over. The serpent of the kundalini is raised first in the physical body. When that process is complete and the fire raises up the spinal column through all 33 vertebra, activating the seven churches in that degree, then there is a celebration in the internal worlds where the being of that person is granted the initiation of the first major mystery. The human soul does not receive that. The personality does not receive that. You and I do not receive that. The being does. The being is the one who receives the gifts and the initiations and the glories. The terrestrial person is just a worker. The terrestrial person is not divine. Unfortunately, there are many who make the mistake of believing that the I receives these gifts and empowerments. That is not the case. The one who receives such a gift is transformed. The being becomes a master. The being, not the human person, not the terrestrial person, the being becomes a master. That being receives initiations, empowerments, glories, celebrations. Receives a temple. Receives a new robe. And receives development in the process of the being itself. The terrestrial person, however, is just beginning. This is only the first baby step. It is a great accomplishment but it does not signify the awakening of a huge percentage of consciousness. The arising of the kundalini of the physical body is the activation of the first degree of the powers of the fire. But that process has to be repeated in the vital body, related to the spinal column of the vital body. And naturally, there are ordeals and tests related to all 33 vertebra and related to the seven churches once again, but in a higher degree and more difficult tests and more requirements. And of course, in return, greater gifts. Each church has with it certain powers, telepathy, astral travel, deepening meditation, the capacity to awaken more intuition, to have more understanding, clear audience, the remembrance of past lives, states of consciousness characterized by feelings of bliss, happiness, spontaneous joy, happiness for others, mental calm. These gifts and benefits are received by the being, who in turn can bestow them upon the student, upon the terrestrial person, in order to help them, to encourage them, to help them move along. Astral experiences. These types of things are given as encouragement by the being, but they're not automatically given. So, with the etheric body, the same process ensues. 
33 vertebra, seven churches, many requirements, a lot of difficulty. With the rising of that second serpent, when it's complete, the being receives the initiation, receives the benefits, receives the glory. With the third initiation, the third serpent related to the astral body, there is a new creation. In the process of raising the third serpent, the solar astral body is created. This is a new vehicle. This vehicle is the first coming of the Christ in us. This is a Christic vehicle of very high value. This is the first body of gold. The creation of the solar astral body marks a specific and definitive turn in the development of the student, the development of the being. In the process of raising the third serpent, black magic and all ties and connections with the Black Lodge must be renounced. This is not easy. This means that a large percentage of our attachments, of our ideas, of our expectations have to be removed. Many things that we have egotistically that we have to renounce. But this process is also very beautiful. It's a process within which the one who recovers the memories of these experiences will experience themselves living the drama of the Christ in the internal worlds. The one who persists takes the ordeals, takes the difficulties, and responds with gentleness, with love, with right action, is able to raise that serpent create the solar astral body within the mysteries of alchemy and transcend the wheel of suffering to a certain percentage. The one who creates the solar astral body frees themselves of the law of return. That is, they're no longer restricted by the limitation of 108 lifetimes in a human vehicle. This person has entered into the path in a new degree. They now have the capacity to persist in their work. Even if the physical, vis physical organism dies, they will be able to take a new birth and continue working without being limited by that karmic law. The solar astral body is the first creation of the bodies of gold, the solar vehicles. There's a new structure that's being built. And of course, many tests, many ordeals, many difficulties. And naturally, this is all dependent on working as a couple, man and woman. Upon creating the solar astral body, there is the fourth serpent related to the mental body. The solar mental body has to be created. And again, 33 vertebra, seven churches, many ordeals, many tests, many difficulties. Requires much patience. In the rising of this fourth serpent, the difficulties, the tests, the ordeals are more subtle, deeper, more painful, more difficult to perceive and related more to the mind. When that serpent is complete, the inner self, the being, it becomes a Buddha. The inner being when the fourth initiation of major mysteries is complete, the inner being becomes a Buddha and is presented in the internal worlds as a new Buddha and is given the robes of a Buddha. The terrestrial person is not a Buddha, neither a Bodhisattva. The terrestrial person is just that. So the inner being receives this glory receives this development, new robes, new initiations, new powers. And the human soul, the terrestrial person, has to continue working. In the fifth serpent. The fifth is related to the causal body, the body of willpower. And again, 33 vertebra, seven churches, much patience. 
When this process is complete, after long suffering, many ordeals, the solar causal body is complete. What has now been established is the bodies of gold, what in Greek is called to soma heliakon, the bodies of gold of the solar man. We also call this the Merkaba. We also call it the chariot. In Hinduism, we have a symbol which is illustrated in the graphics that we have on the website, which is two men in a chariot driven by four horses. The four horses are the first four bodies, physical, vital, astral, and mental. Those four bodies are the four bodies of sin, the four vehicles of the terrestrial person. The fifth is the causal body, which is one of the men in the chariot. In Hinduism, in the Bhagavad Gita and Mahabharata, he's called Arjuna. And Arjuna is a symbol of the human soul. The human soul is dressed with the solar causal body. The human soul is our human consciousness. In Hebrew, this is also called Tiparet. This is the human aspect of our inner being. The person who has reached this degree of development has become a human being. A person within which the terrestrial aspect and the spiritual aspect have become united in the first degree. The human soul and the being, the spirit, now have a union of will. To a certain percentage. The human soul, symbolized by Arjuna, is the warrior, the fighter. This is the terrestrial person who now has the capacities and abilities of what is really a normal human being. That is, has the four lower bodies active and standing upright, has the five Serpents of the Kundalini, active and upright, and has the seven churches active and giving powers and blessings to that soul. This is a normal human being. This is the state of the human being as it should be, with the capacity to relate one-on-one with their own inner God, to receive direct instruction from their own inner spirit to know the mysteries of life and death directly, to have intuition, to remember past lives, to have the ability to perceive things beyond the physical senses, to have peace of mind, to have a peaceful heart, to have understanding of suffering to a certain degree. This is what a normal human being is. We are not that. Because we are trapped in pride and in anger and in fear. And we're very confused. And we have no direct knowledge of things of the spirit. We have theories. The person who's reached Tipperet, who's developed the solar bodies, who's reached the fifth initiation of major mysteries, still has ego, a lot of ego. This person still has a lot of karma. This person still has a lot of pride. The being has development. The inner self has become a Buddha, has become an angel, has become a well-developed being. But the terrestrial person is still that, terrestrial, with faults, with mistakes, with errors. At this moment, upon completing this stage, that human soul is given a choice, how to proceed in their development internally. 
two paths open in front of that person, in front of that initiate. And they're shown what lies ahead on either path. To the left, a vast spiral with an easy slope, with a very long process, within which that person will retain the use of their vehicles to travel in the internal worlds, will retain all the powers and gifts of the active and awakened churches, will retain their abilities of telepathy, clairvoyance, polyvision, astral travel, and will walk slowly, paying karma little by little, and enjoying all the benefits and pleasures of nirvana. Then there's the other path on the right. Very steep, covered with thorns, difficulties, pain, ridicule, criticism, gossip, the envy of others, the hate of others, rejection, retribution, loneliness, darkness. To walk that path one renounces all the powers, all the benefits, renounces and gives up self-use of telepathy, clairvoyance, astral travel. Walks away from all of those gifts, all of those pleasures of nirvana to enter into the darkness of the straight path. The difference is this. In the straight path, there's the ability to pay the entirety of one's karma right away, even within one lifetime. There's the capacity to proceed in the process of one's initiation. More than that, one incarnates the Christ itself. In taking the straight path, the initiate who chooses the straight path incarnates the Christ, becomes a vehicle of the solar logos, chokmah, the sun. The one who takes the spiral path, the nirvanic path, does not incarnate the Christ. The one who takes the spiral path, the nirvanic path, takes eons to pay their karma. This one does not proceed in the processes of initiation. They work little by little, occasionally eliminating a small percentage of ego. And their human soul incarnates again and again, repeatedly, according to karmic requirements. So each lifetime that that human soul manifests, they're still victim of their karma while the being is enjoying nirvana. But that human soul of the nirvanic path has bliss, has powers, has abilities, may teach the dharma, may help others to a certain percentage, may be a good person, trying to be. may try to help other souls, or may not. But the one who takes the straight path, the difficult path, takes the path of the bodhisattva. The path of the bodhisattva is the direct path, direct to the absolute. The only one who can take the soul to the absolute is the Christ. No one reaches the Father except by me, the Son, the Christ. The Bodhisattva renounces nirvana, renounces a life of ease, renounces millennia 
of easy manifestations, easy existences, easy lifetimes, renounces all the bliss and powers that they've already acquired. Why, you might ask, would someone choose that? Why would someone choose to renounce those pleasures, to renounce those powers and abilities, and enter into the world to be hated and spat upon? Not only by humankind, so-called humankind, but by those who take the nirvanic path as well. Why would someone choose to make the attempt to pay lifetimes of karma in one life for love? For love of humanity? For love of others? To follow the Christ? The cosmic Christ is love itself, conscious love. This love is so profound, so penetrating, so all-encompassing. The one who has achieved some degree of understanding of that wants to embody that, to become a perfect expression of that love, a perfect vehicle through which that love can shine. The nirvanis, or the pratyeka buddhas, or the shravakas, these are the walkers of the spiral path, do not comprehend that love. They remain attached to power, to gifts, to nirvana. That rare soul who takes the straight path has tasted the pure love of the Christ and wants to become that, to become one with that. This is very rare for any soul to take that path. The vast majority of those who achieve the completion of the fifth mystery, the fifth uh, initiation of major mysteries, the vast majority choose the spiral path because they remain attached to their powers, to their development, to their abilities, and they are afraid. When seeing those two paths, what you see is your karma. You see what you have to pay. You see what you have to suffer. Most can't take it. Most run away, terrified, and take the nirvanic path and become pratyeka buddhas, nirvanic buddhas. They have their beauties, they have their gifts, they have their place, they have their importance. But one must never confuse a walker of the straight path with a walker of the spiral. The teachings of Samael Anvior are the teachings of the straight path they are the teachings of the path of the bodhisattva. They are not to be confused with the teachings of the spiral. Both teach about love. Both teach about charity. Both teach about sanctity. The need to reduce the ego. Both even teach about transmutation. They teach about powers. They teach about meditation, about the astral world, the mental world. What is the distinction? Self-sacrifice. The Pratyeka Buddhas remain selfish. The Nirvanis want to build big organizations. The Pratyeka Buddhas and their human souls are very much attached to the teachings themselves. They want to build big churches, cathedrals, groups, worldwide organizations, vast spiritual industries. The walker of the straight path 
wants the ego to die at all costs. Walker of the straight path is attached to nothing and to no one. The walker of the straight path is revolutionary, is radical. The nirvanis hate the walkers of the straight path. And it sounds strange. How can a Buddha hate another Buddha? But it happens. If you study the Mahabharata and some of the other classics of Eastern literature, you see wars among the gods. Even in our Western mythologies, there are wars between the gods. And these are because of a fundamental difference of point of view. For the student, for the aspirant, this becomes very important. By studying teachings, we're taking influences into our psyche and into our soul. But what influences are we taking? What subtleties are present in those teachings? From what source do they emanate? The Master Samael on Vior stated very clearly, his teachings are the teachings of the straight path. However, most of his students will take the spiral path. And what did he say about that? He said, well, <clears throat> those who take the spiral path, we will have to say goodbye. Many of them continue to teach Gnosis. So they appear to be teaching the teachings of the straight path, but in a spiral way, in a nirvanic way. Tipreb, the human soul, is the one who makes this decision. However, the decision should be made by the will of the being. Tipreb properly defined and developed is the human expression of divine will. The initiate who faces the decision to choose between the spiral and straight paths should rely upon the guidance of the being and do what the being wants. That is to say, the being may want to take the nirvanic path, and that is the right of that Buddha. And there's nothing wrong with that. However, the straight path is a superior work because the soul who passes through the process of the straight path becomes perfected, becomes a nirmanakaya, dharmakaya, sambhokukaya. Those heights are only reached by the walkers of the straight path. The nirvanis remain simple Buddhas. They do not progress in the development of the soul. They do not perfect the solar bodies. At this level of creation, the solar bodies have been established, but they remain imperfected, and the ego is very much alive. This first stage of the work is simply the establishment of the foundation the development of the chariot in its rawest form. The walker of the spiral path goes very slowly in small steps to very subtly improve upon that. But to perfect the solar bodies, to reduce the ego to zero, to incarnate the Christ, to become a resurrected master, can only be achieved by a walker of the straight path and can only be achieved after passing through incredible ordeals. So when we get to this chapter, the fourth chapter of the book of Revelation, we have to start with this understanding because the first line says, and before the throne, there was a sea of glass. Oh, I'm on the wrong page. Hold on. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened 
in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show you things which must be acquired, which must be hereafter. This vision is the vision of the person who's taken the straight path. Who's being shown what they must accomplish now that they have chosen this work to walk on that straight path. This vision is a vision of Tiparet, a vision of the human soul who's talking with superior aspects of their own inner consciousness. In other words, the Lamb, the Christ, who's taken up residence in them. Without understanding that, this chapter is meaningless. The rest of the book is meaningless. We have to understand this book concerns walkers of the straight path. Those who have renounced everything for the benefit of others. One point to understand is that in certain Eastern traditions, specifically the Mahayana and Tantrayana teachings, the term bodhisattva is used in a much more casual way in the, es- in the exoteric part of those teachings. That is, in some schools, anyone who takes a certain kind of vow and says, I will work for the benefit of all beings, they then call that person a bodhisattva. And some of them call themselves that. This is unfortunate. It's because a bodhisattva is a very rare person. A bodhisattva will never call themselves that. A real one. A real bodhisattva never shows themselves. Never displays anything. Never seeks their own glory exists solely to serve. So it should be understood that as you study and inquire and investigate, that this term bodhisattva is a very specific term that needs to be understood in the right way. But having said that, when we study this chapter, we see that the... The bodhisattva itself, which is that human soul who incarnates the Christ within, then it has before them a whole new set of requirements, a whole new process that they have to pass through. And that's what the coming chapters describe. What is required of that soul on this new path, this distinct work? Of course, the The detailed meanings of this chapter are available on the website. But in particular, I think it's important for us to understand that the work of the bodhisattva, the human soul, is the work to perfect the being. It is not a work of self-perfection in terms of I. The true bodhisattva renounces the self in terms of the I, renounces me. The true bodhisattva performs every action from the point of view of how will this help others. So when measuring and analyzing and choosing what to do, this is the point of view that the bodhisattva has. How will this affect others? This is important because for the student, now is the time to apply this way of thinking. Now is the time to learn to apply the law of the Christ within ourselves. The development and progress of the Kundalini 
is the establishing of a foothold in the realms of the spirit, in the realms of the consciousness. And that foothold is made possible by the Christic fires that circulate in our organism. That fire, that intelligence, that force is the same fundamental energy which will fully incarnate in the bodhisattva. So the student who's beginning to work in this process of developing the soul is well advised to learn to think in a new way, to learn to behave in a new way, to learn how to apply the law of the Christ, the law of sacrifice, from moment to moment. This prepares the consciousness for a special kind of understanding, for a special kind of development in the consciousness, which is called bodhicitta. Bodhicitta is wisdom mind, and it is the essential essence of the Christ itself that is born inside the human being. The walkers of the spiral path, the Buddhist pratyekas and shravakas, develop the soul and develop the consciousness, but they undernourish and underdevelop the bodhicitta. But the bodhicitta, that embryo, that's, that essence of Christic intelligence, is what the bodhisattva will fully develop. So if we now, in our process, begin to think, begin to feel, and act with the principles of bodhicitta, that is, compassion, concern for others, filial love, conscious love, then we prepare our soul in the very process of its creation. Each serpent is a process of harnessing forces and energies in our organism and creating something new. Each act of transmutation, each act of taking food and air and impressions is an act of taking forces and energies and transforming them into something new. If we engage in that process with the consciousness seated in compassion, we build the soul itself with compassionate forces, with the energies of love, with the energies of the Christ. That is, we will develop and build a superior soul. Superior in the sense that it's more pure. There are different ranges of gold the metal, right? There's impure gold and there's very pure gold. The solar bodies are no exception. If in the process of building our own soul, we are moment to moment, day to day, focusing our attentions on how to be better of service, on how to be more helpful and less harmful, on how to serve in the example of the Christ, then each transformation that we make will be of higher quality. And those bodies that we create in the process of alchemy and the process of initiation will be superior, more pure. By grace, this is made possible. And if we're so fortunate to receive the blessing of the incarnation of the Christ, we come to know what that compassion truly is, what love truly is, and what sacrifice truly is. The fourth chapter of this book of Revelation is, in its essence, an outline of how the forces and energies of the Christ are managed and manifest through the bodies of the soul. We see in very Kabbalistic synthesis how the solar logos, or the Christ itself, that 
Trinity manifest its forces through the spirit, the Atman, or the inner self, who in this case is um, manifest through the forces of Hokma into our inner consciousness, into the levels of the spirit. And that force, that intelligence, is managing the, the energies of the Akasha, the descending prana, or energy. And that energy, in turn, is managed through the human soul, Arjuna. And those forces, those energies, are then further differentiated into the four primary elements. So as we've talked about in other lectures, we have this raw solar light that condenses into a variety of forms. And at each level, there are aspects of our soul that manage those forces. And that's what's symbolized in this chapter. The symbol here is of a throne, which is our spinal column, and four beasts. And these four beasts symbolize different things. They symbolize these four lower bodies, physical, vital, astral, and mental. They also symbolize the four lower tattvas, or in other words, the elements. And how those forces are managed by the human soul, Arjuna, Tipperet. And how that human soul, that force, is guided by the inner self, or in this case, through Hokma, which incarnates in the, tip, in the Bodhisattva. So when you study this chapter, you have to keep in mind that that's what this dense symbolism is displaying. How the Bodhisattva manages forces in order to advance in their process. The management of these energies is not just for fun. It's not just to have power. It's not just because it's interesting. The management of the tatbas is fundamentally psychological. And it's the basis upon which the being itself develops into having greater and greater responsibilities. If you consider that your being has the degree of intelligence necessary to create your physical body, all the infinite, incredible structures and complexities of your physical body were created by your being. But more than that, when you advance through these processes of the major mysteries, your being, under the guidance of the Christ, creates more subtle and more powerful and more complex bodies of the soul. And each of those bodies has capacities and has powers, which are beyond comprehension of our intellect. And each of those bodies and aspects of our soul have capacities and requirements. That's partly what this chapter is outlining. How the soul itself relates to and manages the forces of nature. So our physical body, obviously, is related to earth. Alchemically, this is related to salt. And as a tattva, to pritvi. To understand that requires experience. To see how this applies to the process of initiation requires that you are in that process of initiation. But in synthesis, we can say that when you study this book, understand that there are levels of comprehension related to how the soul, in conjunction with the spirit, manages the forces of nature in order to perform the actions it must perform to advance in its work. Throughout, we understand that this process is performed with help, with guidance. And in this chapter we see Hokmah, or the Christ, manifesting in us, in the initiate, 
who's working in conjunction with one of his expressions, which is the forces of the zodiac. And we know in Gnosis that the forces of the zodiac are managed by 24 elders, two related to each sign. But this zodiacal influence is occurring on two levels, the macrocosmic and the microcosmic. And the, the microcosmic, or the small level, is the human being itself. The zodiacal forces that gather and work through the force of the pineal gland. The Christic fires, in conjunction with the zodiacal guidance, the zodiacal influence through the pineal gland. That force, or that guidance, manages these energies of the tattvas and helps to guide that bodhisattva and help in the process of the development of that soul. At the same time, this zodiacal influence of the 24 elders is occurring in the macrocosm or in the universe as, as a whole. So there are levels of application of this teaching. It's very complex, and when you read the chapter, you'll see that. I'm simplifying it a great deal just to make it a little bit comprehensible. In synthesis, we can say that these zodiacal forces in the microcosm or within us are levels of our own consciousness, levels of our own particular being. And those forces are intertwined with the development of the bodhisattva. That's why in the book we see that those, those elders cast their thrones at the feet of the Lamb, of the Christ. That is, that they render respect, devotion, and homage to the Christ, that Christic force. Now, this fourth chapter is very Kabbalistic. Number four, of course, is related with the Arcanum Four, related to the development through alchemy. It's also related to the number six, which is indecision. And six is also related to the process of the human soul, to Tiferet. Um, but in synthesis, we will say that this fourth chapter sets the stage for the rest of the book because the development and requirements of the bodhisattva are set forth in the next chapters. So are there any questions? Yeah, it happens that that those who have taken the spiral path can switch, can then make the decision to enter into the straight path. That has happened. No. To take the straight path is a supreme commitment. Each... Each commitment that we make, each process that we enter into, has responsibilities and requirements, has agreements that we make. The development of the soul is not a solitary work. It's a work that can only be achieved through the assistance of the Christ. The nirvanis, the Pratyeka Buddhas, of course, only achieve a very small development in comparison with the work as a whole. So not much is expected of them. But the walkers of the straight path enter into the potential to develop uh, to an infinite degree. So a lot is expected of them. What that means is that there is a superior law called the law of Katansya, which applies to initiates and those who are walking the path, whether spiral or straight. We answer to that law in accordance with what we receive. Those who are receiving superior development are more liable, or have to answer to more, have more responsibility. So to betray that, 
to walk away from that, to reject and renounce and, and renege on those kinds of agreements bears a serious consequence. The law of karma is quite severe. And you can say that the more we receive, the more gifts we're given, the more we have to answer to that law. Nothing comes easy. In Hebrews 9.27, I wonder why it's said that a man is to die once and after this his judgment. A man is to die once and after this what? After this, his judgment. <laughs> is that another lecture? <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure I understand what it the says, question is. I wonder why he said a man is to die once, and after this, his judgment. I'd have to look at that to see. I'm, I'm not sure what that's referring to. Hebrews 9.27. Well, we'll come to that another time, I think. That's another lecture. Okay, next question. If we meet a master in the physical, how can we know if they are taking the spiral path or the straight path? In the first place, anyone who's claiming to be a master in the physical world has probably got a problem. And this problem is called mythomania. In the book, The Greater Mysteries, Samael Anvior states very clearly, we advise our disciples not to follow anyone. We advise disciples to follow themselves, to follow their own inner self. To look for a master in the physical world is to look for problems. The only master that we need is the one who resides within. We need help, we need guidance, we need the study, we need the books, we need the teachings, and we need teachers. But in the, in the context of this current day and age, the ego is so heavy in mankind, and pride is so deceptive, that Samael Anvior gave very specific and clear advice to his students. Do not look for masters. Do not seek to follow anyone. Follow your own inner self. He wrote extensively about mythomania, about the ease with which the human soul can become confused by clairvoyant visions and astral experiences. We are so naive. It may well be that the inner being of a given person is a master. That does not mean that the human soul is a master. It does not mean that the human soul, the terrestrial person, is a master. It does not mean that that terrestrial person is trustworthy. The only one that you can trust is your own inner self. The only one you can rely on completely, without question, without hesitation, and without error, is your own being. He will never mislead you. He will never guide you in the wrong way. But you have to learn to listen to him. You have to develop the capacity to hear his guidance. Unfortunately, in this day and age, we want it easy. We want some person that we can call on the phone or write an email who will tell us what to do. This is wrong. It's wrong. It's wrong because the only one who knows what you should do is your being. No one should ever tell you what to do. No one should ever tell you who to marry, who to be with, what to meditate on. Because no one knows your intimate depths other than your being. Who can give you advice about the nature of your soul and the requirements of your karma? Who can give you advice about the will that your being has for you? Who can tell you what your real mission is? No one. Only your inner self. And he tells you that through meditation. In the book of James it says, Be not many masters. And there's a reason for that. 
The reason is we have one master who is Christ. He manifests through his bodhisattvas in order to teach. But a genuine bodhisattva never announces themselves as that. Once or twice in an age, they might. For a very specific work. But nowadays, we have hundreds of people claiming to be this and that. Claiming to be so and so and such and such. All big names. Some claim to be more than one master at a time. The master so and so and so and so and so and so all in one person. This is so deceiving and sad. What about the Dalai Lama? Is he of the straight path or the spiral? Ask him. What you will find if you ask him is he will say, I am just a monk. And that is the right answer. If you want to know who someone is, if you want to know what path they're on, Go in your astral body and talk to them. If someone's talking about it physically, they're lying. True. To really know... That's that's a true point. To really know, without question, you have to go in the sixth dimension. Because in the astral plane and the mental plane, you can be deceived. In the sixth dimension, you cannot. So develop that capacity. Anyone can develop that ability. Any person. This is not restricted to only certain people who have certain capacities. The ability to investigate things directly, internally, is available to any human person. Any one of us can do it. But to do it, we have to be serious. We have to be dedicated. We have to be devoted. We have to open our heart. The capacity to investigate these kinds of things is not developed by developing the intellect. It's developed by opening the heart. If you have such questions about who's a real master and who is not, what teachings are genuine and which ones are not, work seriously in yourself to investigate these things directly. Books will deceive you. People will deceive you. Schools, organizations, and groups will deceive you. To know the truth, investigate internally, but that does not come easy. You have to pay. Any other questions? Yeah, I got a question. Uh, You said uh, a little bit earlier that we have to um, be compassionate and compassionate. Mm. There is compassion in us. The question is, how can we develop compassion in our level if we don't have compassion? You have the essence. The essence is the embryo of the human soul. It's that seed that we develop and grow into the human soul. And that essence is the vehicle itself of bodhicitta, which is compassion. If you activate your essence, meaning you learn to pay attention, to be present, and to not be caught in the battle of opposites in your mind, then you've set the stage to be present with your consciousness, to use the, the capacities of the consciousness. More than that, if you learn and teach your consciousness to love, to understand another person's point of view, this is not easy to do. It takes effort. But if you try that, you'll find that the essence has that capacity in its level. So if someone attacks you or or gets angry with you, instead of reacting automatically with justifications or defensiveness, try to see their point of view. Try to understand how you created that feeling in them. Try to see yourself from their point of view. And then that, you start to see what compassion really is. Compassion is the ability to understand suffering, but not only your own, to understand the suffering of another person. 
We all have that capacity. We just don't use it. Okay, so the true master doesn't refer to himself as a master, yet he or she speaks the message of his being the master. How would we distinguish the person from a person who is a channeler, who says they are channeling their own being or higher self? First of all, if someone says they're a channeler, then they are. So in teachings of Gnosis, we understand that channeling and mediumism is deceptive, so one should walk away. Secondly, in order to learn what teachings are true and what are not, you have to combine two things. You have to combine your own experience, your own sense of what is right and wrong, what is true and what is not. You have to combine that with study, study of the scriptures, study of, of true enlightened beings. Buddha, Krishna, Jesus, Muhammad, these types and levels of people are who we need to study. For some reason, nowadays, we prefer to read common people's point of view, books that we can buy in any bookstore. Somehow, we have this, this um, interest in studying books that were just written this year or last year rather than a book that was written a thousand years ago and has proven itself through the test of time and has inspired millions. We prefer to read a bestseller. This is worth examining in ourselves. But in synthesis, I would say, to really understand whether a teaching is good or not, you have to combine those two things. What is good and true in your experience? And second, how does that teaching relate to the teachings of the great masters, the great teachers? Not just those who are proclaiming themselves nowadays, but the real great ones like Moses. Other questions? Here's what's important. The development of the human soul is in your hands. No guru and no master can do it for you. No book. No matter how sacred a book is, a book cannot save you. No matter how many members attend a school, a school cannot save you. No matter how many degrees, initiations, and titles a person claims to have, they cannot save you. You cannot rely on anyone. You ask about the Dalai Lama. He said, you cannot rely on the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. The Dalai Lama said, I cannot take a person out of the abyss into nirvana. No one can save you. Only you can save yourself. You save yourself through your action, not through ideas, not through theories, and you do it today. So long as you think, I'll learn to meditate later. I'll study later. I'll try these, these practices tomorrow. You will never do it. You have to discipline your mind to work in the moment. The door to ascend the vertical path is in the present moment. It does not exist in the future or the past. And no one can walk through that door for you. In fact, no one can even open the door for you. So it doesn't matter whether you find a great master or not. It doesn't matter whether you have a big library. What you need is practical action in yourself in the moment.
The presentation of this lecture was made possible by donations from listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most Gnostic schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every single donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticRadio.org. For questions and deeper understanding of this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing and available from booksellers worldwide. Visit GnosticBooks.org to learn more. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Mm-hmm.